Good morning. It is a fantastic day at Cuesta College and an absolute pleasure to welcome you. You walked into music from Cuesta Jazz 2010 under the direction of our very own Ron Carley. Let's begin today with our land acknowledgement. We collectively acknowledge that Cuesta College occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of both the Salinan and the Northern Chumash, who are the original, current, and future caretakers of the land upon which we, as guests, work, teach, and learn. I'd like to welcome um, our trustees who have joined us today. We have our board president, Mrs. Mary Strobridge, Board Vice President, Dr. Deborah Stakes. And our long-serving trustee, Mr. Pat Mullen. On behalf of each of us, thank you for your service and commitment to Cuesta College. We appreciate you spending time with us this morning. I also want to welcome those of our Cuesta College community who are joining us online. We wish you were here to join us in person today and look forward to seeing you soon. As a reminder, our restrooms are located in the lobby near the entrance of the building. Feel free to excuse yourself at your convenience as there is not a break in today's presentation. In the event of an emergency, there are two vestibules located halfway through the audience that will take you to hallways through and out of the building. We have much to squeeze in by 11 o'clock, so my update today will be very brief, and we will have an important instructional update from Dr. Jason Curtis leading into our keynote address. Our session will end not with coupons for additional burritos, nor a concert by Fergie. You need to see Dr. Greg Baxley about that. Um, but this morning's session will conclude with a special student message, a love letter to Cuesta College. We're going to begin now by introducing our new employees. Hello, my name is Adriana Gaeta, and I am the EOPS Care of CalWORKS Foster Youth Program Assistant. My name is Lisa Matthews, and I am an Academic Success Specialist. Hi, my name is Paul Fordyce. I'm the Community Programs Coordinator for Aquatics and Recreation. Hi, I'm Gustavo Enriquez, and I'm a Program Coordinator. Hi, my name is Melissa Boyda. I'm an Enrollment Success Specialist. Hi, my name is Morgan Couture, Enrollment Success Specialist. Hi, my name is Liana rivera Cordera, and I am a CalWORKS EOPS Care Foster Youth Technician. Hi, my name is Jenny Anderson, and I'm a Workforce Job Development Recruiter in Career Connections. My name is Christopher Acevedo, and I'm a Financial Aid Specialist. Hi, I'm Lauren Garcia, um, and I'm a Counselor's Assistant. Hi, my name is Erica Dalstall, and I'm the Graphic Designer here at Cuesta College. Hi everyone, I'm Jasmine Lopez and I'm the Bilingual Academic Success Coach. Hi, my name is Sammy Brown, a new hire for custodial position here at uh, Cuesta College. Hello, my name is Bradley Kennedy. I'm a new custodian at the San Luis Obispo campus for your night shift. Hi, my name is Michaela Padgett and I am assistant toddlers teacher. Hello, my name is Kimberly Douglas, and I'm an ESL instructor at North County Campus. Hi, I'm Sebastian Tajada, and I'm an instructor of Ethnic Studies. Hi, I'm Eli Schoenauer, and I'm a registered nurse clinical instructor at Cuesta. Hi, my name is David Pascola, and I'll be teaching digital photography. Hi, I'm Ruta Saliklis, and I will be teaching art appreciation.
Dr. Oscar Ramos, and you know the instruction. So a special thanks to our marketing department for the video introduction of our newest employees and those in new positions. And an apology, um, we had a failed file and so some of our video introductions turned into written introductions this morning. So Cuesta College has a beloved tradition of acknowledging milestones with pens and recognizing years of service beginning at the five year anniversary. Watch for your pen to arrive in the mail and today we are going to celebrate first those with five years of service. Dr. Correa and I are going to uh, split the duty here, alternate slides, and apparently I was given the duties of going first. So uh, first off celebrating five years, Linda Agens, Ryan Amborn, Sil Arena, Benjamin Arona, Darlene Azevedo, Nicholas Bockelman, Sean Bowman. Okay, so the another group is Elise Caloca, Alba Canso Bigav, Chris Carroll, Donald Cleave, Monica Contreras, Mallory Cronin, and Cindy Dilbeck. Continuing on, Brian Doan, Robin Dungan, Christy Ezofsky, sorry, Roseanne Field, Eric Finlayson, Kelly Gottlieb, and Christine Groff. Janelle Guadagno, Sibony Guardado, Jacob Hafner, Scott Halverson, Ruth Hansen, Dean Harrell, and David Howell. Joan Hurwitt, Anusha Reddy Conda, Doris Lance, Andrea LaRosa, Zachary McKiernan, Whitney Meyer, and Karen Osborne Pruitt. Alicia Paniawa, Michael Pereira, Troy Cumby, Christine Reddy, Adrian Sandvik, Jennifer Severson, and Ashley Shimabuku. Malka Stein, Melanie Stokes, Grant Trexler, Ignacios Vacalis, Teresa Vanderhoven, Everardo Vences Gonzalez, and Cody Winkelpeck. Okay, now celebrating 10 years, Lara Baxley, Jeremy Betancourt, Jules Davis, Stephanie Fikri, Beth Johnson, Tiffany Kerr, Elizabeth Lobo, and Carrie Martinson. Corey Main, Sonia Mendoza, Jessica Mickelson, Mike Mogul, Matt Owen, Mike Serpa, and Amy Young. Celebrating 15 years of service, April Anderson, John Arno, Michael Bach Peters, David Brown, Jennifer Chavez, Raymond Dienzo, Sherry Ferguson, and Cheryl Gannett. Richard Goldsmith, Brian Loker, Clint Martin, Lori McConico, Ronald McDonald, Monica Millard, Stacy Millich, and Hunter Perry. Paul Portuguese, Dennis Rowley, Paul Schmidt, Teresa Shoten, Tracy Skull, Jaron Smitson, Mark Spartan, and Keith Wabel. The lists are getting shorter as we climb up to the 20 year people Chris Ballou, Catherine, no, Katie Dittmer, Tanya Downing. Chris Green, Matthew Green, Bruce Henderson, Tracy Haller, and Thea LeBrenz. Okay. 
Liz Mifsfood, Laura Moore, Gerardo Morales, Bonnie Morris, Margarita Ramirez Morales, Gary Rubin, Estela Vasquez, and Regina Vogue. Twenty-five years at Cuesta College for Chris Achillian, Ethan Bertrando, Karen Kaufman, Matthew Fleming, Catherine Hillman, Stacy Kimmy, Margaret Coraschelli, D. Limon, Amity Perry Boada, Kathleen Peters, Nanette Pina Stevens, Robert Schwenke, Terry Sherman, and Michael Smiley. One big one, keep the applause going, 30 years for Mark Turner. And 35 years for men's basketball coach, Rusty Blair. And now let's recognize our colleagues who are enjoying retirement. Sorry, we thought we were done. <laughs> Karen Andrews, Grant Chesey, Sarah Guglamo, Greg Lewis, Suzanne MacArthur, Madeline Medeiros Taylor. Oh, Denise McDonough, Eduardo Pinon, Lisa Purcell, Tony Rector, Marcia Scott, Jonathan Wilson, and Bob Wilson. So our congratulations to each one reaching a service milestone and special thanks for the service of our recent retirees. A very special group served Cuesta College in an unprecedented and essential manner since March 2020. This is the Mighty 19. Will the COVID-19 planning team members please come forward to the stage? This group provided essential collaborative leadership throughout the pandemic. They each brought their experience and knowledge into the difficult conversations of protocol. They asked questions, researched options, brought forward concerns, and communicated with their represented groups. They all went far above the delineated responsibilities in their job description in their service to Cuesta College to ensure the well-being of our campus and community. I cannot adequately express my appreciation for their exceptional service and generous investment of time in the COVID-19 planning team. In the darkest hours of the pandemic, the Mighty 19 stood together in decision making, ensuring that all voices were heard in decisions large and small. With incredible thanks, Today, I offer this formal recognition of leadership appreciation. It reads, COVID-19 planning team leadership appreciation in recognition of exceptional service and commitment to the well-being of Cuesta College community throughout the pandemic, March 2020 to August 2022, given this day, August 12th, 2022. Please join me in thanking the COVID-19 planning team. Thank you very much. And yes, meetings are still on the schedule. <laughs> we're, not done. So we're, we're not quite done, but I appreciate you all very, very much. <laughs> it's always so much fun to recognize exceptional service. And our Classified Employee of the Year nomination comments included. This is a juggler with many plates in the air at any given moment, but always willing to add another plate if it means being able to help someone. Able to troubleshoot and problem solve while staying calm and focused. Amazing can do, you bet, already did that attitude and know-how. 
Customer service skills are top notch and are regularly used when students need help finding their classroom or the name of someone who can help them solve a problem. They never send anyone away without a resolution or the first step to a resolution. Makes everything more fun, whether adding a prize drawing to a professional development activity or organizing another round of the campus-wide Halloween costume contest. Have some ideas? Organized a pilot program, College for a Day, to introduce seventh grade students to college. College for a Day has become an annual event drawing busloads of students who interact with faculty and staff while touring the campus and taking part in activities. The Classified Employee of the Year is Mylea Christensen. Congratulations, Mylea, we appreciate you. <laughs> the nomination comments for Management Senate Employee of the Year include, puts the needs and welfare of our students and employees first. Prompt to get back to you with complete and exact information. Willing to stop what they are doing to help others, even though they are busy with their own workload, and prioritizes customer service so that visitors to the district feel welcomed and accepted. Always a team player, always willing to step up and assist as needed. As a new employee, I was nervous about my first days, but they made the transition appear seamless. They recognized my fear and stepped up to make me feel welcome and help teach me. Never shies away from taking on complex tasks, collaborates with all departments, and is a primary contact for many. They have worked in several departments across campus and is committed to Cuesta's mission, vision, and values. The Management Senate Employee of the Year is Stephanie Federico. Stephanie is not here today. <laughs> Stephanie is actually at Title IX investigator training. It's offered once in California this year. So congratulations, Stephanie, we appreciate you. Academic Employee of the Year. The nomination comments included they are caring and kind and form a real connection with students. Ensure students have the tools to pass their class. Has adjusted their course, syllabus, and teaching style to be equitable and inclusive of all student needs. Worked closely with the equity director to trial a new form of grading, testing, and assignments in order to creatively serve and meet the needs of all students. Works closely with the success Student Success Center staff and refers students to coaches as needs arise. Involved in the Latina Leadership Network and the Mecha Club. Actively seeks to get involved at Cuesta to meet students outside the classroom to better understand who they are and what their needs are. Great example of effective student-centered faculty member. Passionate about encouraging students of color to pursue STEM fields. Applied for the LSAMP, a grant that financially assists students of color in STEM and community colleges. The Academic Employee of the Year is Gabriel Cuarenta Gallegos. Congratulations, Gabby. We appreciate your service on behalf of students. 
The Dr. Marie E. Rosenwasser President's Leadership Award was renamed in 2010 to recognize our retired superintendent president, Dr. Marie E. Rosenwasser. The award is reserved for any employee who uses leadership skills to tackle a problem, who takes some risk, who is patient and persistent, and who achieves a result that brings about institutional change. A leader recognizes a need, analyzes the problem, finds resources, plans solutions, and acts. The Dr. Marie E. Rosenwasser President's Leadership Award is presented to Nicole Johnson. COVID has impacted the way many managers have had to do business and lead their teams, none more so than Nicole. Nicole has brought health expertise, patience, exemplary leadership, and kindness in her role in leading the Student Health Center and overall efforts to keep the employees and students healthy on campus during the pandemic. From athletics, to unions, to campus departments, Nicole has worked with numerous programs to ensure the health and well-being of our campus community. Throughout the pandemic, the strength of Nicole's team building abilities became even more evident. Her leadership in launching test sites, working on the COVID-19 planning team, contact tracing, assisting students with cleared four, and adding student telehealth support have proven her skill at managing numerous large-scale projects sim simultaneously. Nicole is someone who not only faced, but embraced the challenges brought by the pandemic. Her leadership is not just commendable, but life-saving. Congratulations, Nicole. Academic Senate Council President, Dr. Wes Sims, will present the Teaching Excellence Award. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you all here. To win this award, one must be nominated and selected by their colleagues and have at least five years of teaching service at Cuesta. We don't usually mention the five-year criterion because often winners are well past the five-year service mark. However, this year's award winner's division attempted to nominate her last year, but the division ran into this cruel criterion of five years. <laughs> so they had to wait until now to award and acknowledge their colleague for her expertise in teaching. The nominators expressed that she stands out for her innovation and creativity, especially in the digital classroom. How does the division know that she is an excellent teacher filled with innovation and creativity if they haven't all sat in her classroom? The nominators had a clear answer to this question. She has directly taught the faculty in her division how to innovate and adapt to the restrictions of being online during the pandemic. She also shared this newly found knowledge with the entire campus, co-leading seven flex sessions from 2021 to 2022 alone. Let me first give you an example of what innovation looks like in a chemistry lab at the height of the pandemic. Unsatisfied in just recording videos of her labs, she came up with the idea to live stream her labs using multiple Zoom cameras. She set up an apparatus cam, a mobile and positioned right next to whatever she was working on, a hood cam, which is the top view, a POV cam, later named the chemist cam, a balance cam, I have no idea what that is, and one camera pointed at herself so students could see her as she spoke to them. She used those five cameras to give her students not a flat and inflexible computer screen, but to give them context, dimension, 
and perspective. I think there is something to creativity that necessitates that a person doesn't take themselves too seriously. In fact, you might know her by her email avatar of the 1990s cultural icon who announces himself, and by extension our award winner announces herself as the great Cornholio. <laughs> and she isn't afraid to make her students laugh. She keeps her students interested and entertained by creating videos for each class. In her own words, she describes her vert video creations as, quote, some sort of introduction made up of some popular show's theme song, Simpsons, for example, or a scene in a movie that I've guerrilla edited to be about our class. It's a little thing that I do that students look forward to, aside from my lectures, of course. And I enjoy trying to put something funny together, end quote. In reading her nomination, the committee got to watch a video of the Brady Bunch intro dubbed into a song describing what happens when two noble gases meet. <laughs> I, I can send you the link. For her innovation, her creativity, her curiosity, and her humor, we recognize this year's 2022 Teaching Excellence Award winner, Kelly Gottlieb. from people who I consider to be excellent teachers <laughs> is um, very humbling and very appreciated. Um, I'm not usually speechless. <laughs> um, I uh, am very appreciative of, of everybody in my division humoring me as I show them all the weird, exciting things I do on Canvas. And I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the other Dr. Gottlieb who um, isn't here, I guess, but that's okay because he's got opening today, opening day today too, um, for allowing my stream of consciousness to interrupt his train of thought. So, <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> I, that's all. I Congratulations, Kelly. Please join me in congratulating once again all of those honored today. All right, my update is going to be brief and it will start with, we have moved. If you are looking for the president's office, um, we are no longer in the 8,000 building Loomis administration, um, but are in 6600B near lot three and campus police. Human resources and the foundation team are also located in 6600 for the project duration. Um, we expect that the Slow Campus Center is going to be a three-year project, so you need to make note of this address. <laughs> um, administrative services and marketing are relocating to the 5700 to 5900 built modulars, which are near the cafeteria, which previously housed Columbia College, who is now in our university center in 3400. Our COVID-19 protocol. In consultation with Slow County Public Health and in alignment with the protocols at Cal Poly for fall 2022, Cuesta College strongly recommends but does not require masks be worn indoors regardless of vaccination status. All protocols, including masks, are subject to change in accordance with Slow County Public Health guidance. Um, I'm missing a slide. Sorry about that. 
I had a really nice slide that was a screenshot of the updated COVID-19 um, page. The alert banner is no longer on Cuesta.edu, but instead there is a, a link at the very top of the page. And that will take you to a, a reformatted for ease of use um, page that really provides students and employees direct information to questions. But all of the historic information is available if you click COVID-19 communications from that site. Enrollment. This could just as easily be titled budget, as enrollment remains the predominant factor in the SCFF, our student-centered funding formula. Our budget is really exceptional this year, and there are protections in place for fiscal year 2024. However, to ensure we do not face a sharp reduction or fiscal cliff in three years, we must restore our enrollment to the pre-pandemic level. This is set out in our tentative budget where fall 2022 enrollment target is 4.7% above fall of 2021. Today our enrollment is 2.8% below where we were last year at this on opening day. And we're at 67.8% of our target. Restoring our enrollment requires each of us to actively engage in telling the Cuesta College story in our neighborhoods and in our community. With our permanent and temporary employees, we generally have a payroll of about 1,100 individuals. To put it simply, if each of us brought just one full-time student, the gap would be closed. Certainly, we are actively engaged in robust enrollment management strategies, but the importance of personal interaction is enhanced in this period of endemic. Strategic planning. This fall, the campus community will engage in a comprehensive review of the Cuesta College mission, vision, and values. This will serve as the foundation to our long-term institutional planning. And next fall, we will launch the educational master plan and facilities master plan development process. This year, we will also pick up the compressed calendar exploration. As Cal Poly draws closer to determining the length of their future semester, we have renewed opportunity to gather collectively to pursue the options and impacts available to Cuesta through a revised academic calendar. I'll close with a quick reminder that Human Resources, Administrative Services, and Student Success and Support Programs have provided video updates. The links will be included with the recording of this session. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Curtis for a moment of instruction. I'm more comfortable standing with the mic in my hand. Okay, so just a quick notice, uh, a quick update from instruction. So, Five years ago, the, the chancellor's office, the community college chancellor's office, uh, put out the vision for success. It was a five-year strategic plan for the system. And there were several goals in the vision for success around transfer. Uh, specifically, one of those was to increase the number of students who transferred each year to the CSU or UC by 35%. That's a lot decrease the number of units accumulated by students who earn associate's degrees, and reduce equity gaps in the above measures through faster improvement in disproportionately impacted groups, or DI groups. You'll hear me talk about a lot. So increase the number, decrease the number of units they earn, and do that with equity in mind. And we've made good progress on that. Um, the system's done quite well, Cuesta's done quite well, and has been recognized for our work. But there are still some gaps, there are still some shortfalls, and when we leave shortfalls on the table, sometimes the legislature responds with helpful legislation to help us get better. Um, most of you are very familiar with AB 705, the, the requirement that students go directly into transfer level math and English. We've talked about that a number of times at opening day over the past couple years. Um, 
also AB 1705 out there in the works that might forbid us from teaching any pre-transfer level English and math. And so quietly, while we were focusing on those things, the legislature passed AB 928 last year. And this comes from a place, this legislation is truly supported by the equity champions in the state. The intent here is to make sure that we truly meet those transfer goals in the vision for success with equity in mind. And AB 928 establishes that there will be a common general education transfer curriculum for the CSU and UC. Those of you who are involved with transfer know that we have the CSU gen ed pattern and the UC or IGETC gen ed pattern and those two don't exactly line up. And so the legislature has declared that within a couple years they will. Um, the intent is to decrease the confusion for students and make it much easier for students to stay on the path so that if you, know, if you imagine a student starts at Cuesta, they think maybe they wanna go to Berkeley, so they start taking the UC pattern and then they decide they're not gonna do that, they're gonna go to UC, uh, to a CSU campus. Now they have to take different classes to fulfill that requirement. The idea is to eliminate all that and keep students on the path together. It will also require us, the community colleges, to place any student who walks through the door and says they want to transfer onto an ADT pathway. So this is to ensure that students really just take those 60 units of the ADT, they get their transfer completed, and they benefit from the guarantees of the ADTs. But let's think about what this could do for the community colleges, and I don't bring this up to panic anyone or to to cause uh, an issue or have you worry, but AB 928, as it's currently being discussed, so there's a committee that has gotten together. There are representatives from the Chancellor's Office, Statewide Senate for, or Statewide Academic Senate for Community Colleges, and the Student Senate for Community Colleges, but also lots of reps from the UC and CSU. And that committee has been working on that standardized curriculum and some of the things that it looks like they're leaning into right now are things listed on this slide. For instance, the, the courses that fulfill the requirement for oral communication are going to need to be UC level speech courses. There's so much in that that is hard to unpack, but um, think about that part. Um, area D, which was already affected, um, reduced from nine units to six with the addition of ethnic studies, now looks like it may be combined with the CSU's American Institutions requirement, which essentially means that most students would fulfill Area D by taking U.S. History and Political Science and not any of the other courses that we currently offer in Area D. And also the common unified gen ed curriculum will get rid of area E, which is the lifelong learning area. Also, that part about putting students on an ADT if they say they want to transfer is going to reduce the emphasis on our local degrees. So I don't raise these things again. Um, this came from a place of really being concerned about equity outcomes for our students. And I don't want you to leave with the idea that this is an example of equity work or equity legislation gone wrong. It's not. It's an example of the ways in which we haven't done enough yet, and the legislature is more than willing to step in and fix things for us. So our current transfer outcomes at Cuesta, last, uh, in 2021, we don't have the, the spring data yet, in 2021, we had 628 students who earned an ADT. That's up over 200 students from two years before that, so that's great progress. But our ADT completers earned an average of 80 units when it only takes 60 to get an ADT. Now, there is some complication there. You know I'm always trying to be really honest with you. Um, the 60 units, some of these ADTs are people who got multiple ADTs, and so it's not necessarily their first award. Um, ADTs represent 57% of our associate's degrees. And currently about 20% of Cuesta graduates transfer to CSU or UC. And if you're wondering, only 30% go to any four-year institution. So about two-thirds of our transfers do go to the California state system or the UC system.
Okay. That was a little dire, so we're going to move on from that and talk about something much happier. Um, Cuesta, as of Tuesday, is officially a teaching college, and you're thinking, yeah, I thought we'd been that all along. Um, that's a term for the, the California virtual campus has two types of colleges, home colleges, which are exporters into the online environment, and teaching colleges, which can serve as importer, importers in the online environment. So we are now a teaching college. The, the college spent a lot of time over the last four months streamlining things in IT, with Banner, with financial aid. And so what this means is that students at any community college in the state can go on to cvc.edu. They can find and immediately enroll in Cuesta's courses with a simple click. They don't have to apply for, uh, they don't have to do CCC apply. They don't have to do any additional financial aid applications. We simply receive them as if they were a Cuesta student who had applied with us. So we can hope that this is a, a potential boost for enrollment in our online courses and address that enrollment deficit that Dr. Stearns mentioned earlier. And so as part of that, if you've never been on cvc.edu, I hope you'll take time later today to go check it out. And I really want to call out these 18 faculty. I'm not going to read their names because I'm a little behind already. Um, 18 faculty who, in the spring, did the extra work to make sure that their online course had a CVC quality badge. So there's a special CVC rubric um, that has to be judged by an external reviewer. These faculty did that work so that their course, when it shows up on the, the California Virtual Campus, has a special badge that puts it at the top of the list and will hopefully help recruit additional students into that class. Um, we had an alignment academy, a CVC alignment academy, led by Cynthia Wilsusan and with the help of Colleen Harmon and Marilyn Cleves. And so I really want to recognize these people who did a lot of extra work to make sure our courses are out there and visible and of high quality for students coming in from elsewhere in the state. All right, thank you, everyone. It is a privilege to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Regina Stanback Stroud. Dr. Stanback Stroud is an anti-racist activist and committed practitioner facilitating racial and equity literacy development. She dedicated 35 years of her life's work to being a and higher education leader and educator, including service as the Chancellor of Peralta Community College District, the President of Skyline College, various administrative positions, and faculty in nursing. She is now the CEO of RSS Consulting, LLC. Dr. Stanback Stroud served President Barack Obama on his President's Advisory Council on Financial Capability for Young Americans. Her work in equity and leadership is recognized by the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges statewide Regina Stanback Stroud Diversity Award and the Western Regional Council on Black American Affairs Dr. Regina Stanback Stroud Leadership Achievement Award. Both awarded to individuals committed to leadership excellence, equity, and social justice. Dr. Stanback Stroud holds a doctorate and master's degree in educational leadership from Mills College, a master's degree in human relations from Golden Gate University, and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing Sciences from Howard University. Dr. Stanback Stroud's scholarship and expertise has focused on student equity and diversity, education industry collaboratives, economic empowerment and anti-poverty strategies, community workforce and economic development, and regional and state educational policy. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Regina Stanback Stroud. Thank you, thank you so much for that warm welcome. Uh, she's right, I have uh, dedicated 35 years of my life's work uh, to uh, making sure people have access to education because I believe in education as a practice of freedom. Uh, but I did start when I was around two. 
So, <laughs> it's great to be here with you. The, the first thing I want to say is uh, how wonderful for you to welcome me here. Uh, I had the pleasure of visiting Cuesta College many, many, many years ago. I was the state academic senate president and Cuesta was doing some work around governance. I had an opportunity to visit and uh, at that time I stayed at the Madonna Inn, which, <laughs> which was an experience in and of itself. They kind of didn't tell me about that. <laughs> so all night long I was wide awake. Oh, wait a minute. I still have on my cool factor here. Hold on one second. <laughs> all night long I was wide awake. <laughs> uh, but at that time, I think your president, uh, may she rest in peace, it was Dr. Grace Mitchell, so that's how long ago it was. But there are some people that are still here that remember that because I saw those awards. <laughs> uh, and then the other thing I'd like to do is just thank Dr. Jill Stearns for uh, inviting us here, for being willing to engage in the conversations that we'll engage in today and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to you. I want to thank Ryan Cartnell, Jason Curtis, and Todd Frederick for the behind-the-scenes work uh, and so that it makes it look like we know what we're talking about up here. <laughs> I appreciate it. And I want to acknowledge my colleague and my friend and my daughter-in-law, uh, Saida Stroud, who makes it possible for me to look like I perhaps halfway know what I'm doing in this work. <laughs> thank you. So this is a great time. So first of all, uh, you mentioned that I had been in this work for 35 uh, years. That means I've had uh, many, many, many uh, opening days, at least 35 opening days. Uh, and the opening days are really special. They are days of renewal, uh, coming back. There's excitement. There's enthusiasm. Uh, we're committed all over again to the students, or at least most of us are. I mean, some of us are a little bit worn out. You just got jet lag, you just got back from Paris, and you know, that kind of stuff. But, but most of us are, you know, we hit the ground running because we know what's ahead of us, and we understand the significance of the role that we have here. So I just want to acknowledge uh, that and welcome you back to a wonderful academic year. Um, you are committed to a, quite a bit of really important work. Uh, and I know that you'll uh, come up to the task. Um, let's see if I can walk and shoot chewing gum at the same time here. Voila. So just over uh, two years ago, uh, many of us in colleges across the state received notices from our public health officials that we were to go home and shelter in place. Uh, and there was a worldwide pandemic of a deadly virus that would change the way we lived, the way we work, the way we socialized, the way we studied, and perhaps change it forever. I mean, people talk about a new normal and that type of stuff. So there are changes. We won't always be at that state of sheltering in place, but there are definitely, our world has changed, and the way we think about, the ways in which we think about our world and the work that we do uh, has changed. And if we're really honest about it, uh, not, you know, perhaps not including people who understood epidemiology and medicine and those types of things, I don't think we knew to what extent it would have an impact on us. To be honest, when I walked out of my office and we sent everybody home that day, I kind of left everything at the office because I figured we'd be back, you know, we'd be back in a little bit, you know, kind of like a, a power outage day or something, you know, and, you know, my coffee cup was still in the office and, you know, my makeup was still in the drawer at my desk and, you know, I just kind of thought we'd be back, you know. And literally two years later, we're still trying to make decisions about how we do what we do. Uh, and I mean, I had to adjust. I mean, I just learned how to start wearing shoes again, okay? <laughs> I mean, I had to make some adjustments, you know. And, you know, it takes a, takes a village to get me dressed because otherwise I'd have walked out of the house just dressed top up. You know, so, so there were adjustments. I understand now what they mean when they say dress rehearsal. You know, because I had to like put on a lot of different dresses to make sure they fit <laughs> to get here. <laughs> but aside from my struggles, uh, which are all first world problems, um, this pandemic laid bare the impact of the systems and structures that create inequity in our societal institutions, including our educational institutions. And we've suffered a significant loss uh, we've lost millions of lives. 
and we continue to lose them. That accentu and those, that loss accentuates, accentuates the disparities, the disparities in the loss of learning, in the loss of employment, in the loss of business and industries, in the loss of homes, in the loss of financial resources, and the loss of opportunity. But of significance is the loss of innocence. And that loss of innocence is that because we have come to a rude awakening from our delusion of American exceptionalism. Our nation, one of the richest nations on the planet Earth, one of the most advanced, most educated nations in the world had no national response that would protect us from losing millions of lives. As a matter of fact, we exponentially lead in the loss of life and the cases of this pandemic around the world. And indeed, those expected, as we expected, those disparities that normally exist in our uh, nation were further impacted by this virus. And the secondary effects of society and the rollout of the vaccine all had disparities that in this nation comes with its complex geopolitical, socio-historical context. And it can be predicted by race and class which are inextricably linked. So the unique nature of the challenges that we face, including the COVID-19 including the COVID-19 pandemic, widespread systemic is widespread systemic structural racism. Uh, national unrest, unrest, polarization. Uh, and that presents us with the opportunity to come forward with our best selves. Quest College is practiced and is polished in serving the community in ways that now most institutions and many societal systems must participate. And this means that this is your time, Cuesta. This is the moment where you get to use your deep knowledge in this work, and you get to recognize the imperative of addressing inequity and perfecting yourselves to be successful in your mission. So yes, think about your greatness, but also about the opportunities to get it right because so many people are counting on you to get it right. So let's examine where and how we show up uh, with a level of critical racial and equity literacy that can be modeled for the state, if not the nation, about what's possible that will make a difference in the lives of so many men, so many students. So this year has been quite a year for everybody. It's been full of challenges. It goes beyond the customary things that students face on a daily basis as they try to make a way out of no way. They go to work, they do their academic work, they carry out their responsibilities, they go to class, they study, they turn in their assignments, and they take the exams, all while trying to do basic things like make sure they have enough to eat, transportation, make sure they have health care, child care, make sure they have a roof over their head. And that was all before the pandemic. The spread of the disease across the globe at a rate un unimaginable in, uh, in otherwise in, in, in scenes like, movie scenes like Outbreak. You can imagine it in those types of things. Yet, long before there was a health pandemic in these United States and in the context of our geopolitical history and present, we endure on a daily basis an unrelenting, unforgiving pandemic of racism. And there is no vaccine for that. It is one that engulfs most of our societal systems, including economics, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, healthcare, finance, employment, housing, and yes, education. The academy is not exempt. Most of the systems are interconnected and they sh are sure to prop up each other so that the employment systems ensure drastic disparities in income and the assets creating housing patterns and then the housing patterns and laws entrap the communities of color and it sends the students to under-resourced schools because the funding is based on property taxes which in turn is highly unsuccessful in education and students of color are then less successful in attaining employment and vulnerable to the criminal justice system that disproportionately incarcerates them or kills them. And yes, education is a willing, 
knowing hog in this structure. And so the pandemic of racism is particularly vitriolic. It has the amazing characteristic of being so normal, like the air we breathe. It's so normal that it's regularly challenged as to if it really even exists. I mean, really, really, Regina? I mean, but wasn't that a long time ago? <laughs> as my son said to me one time in the grocery store when I said something to him, giving him one of my deep and profound lessons in life on race. He was like, yeah, mom, wasn't that a long time ago, like when you were born? Okay. <laughs> But we have centuries of legally sanctioned strategies and systems and structures to make sure that the impact and the effect is present day. And it's not about our individual feelings or perspectives, it is about the structure and the power to keep those structures in place in order to produce the, the disparities that can be predicted by race. So we engage in debates about whether something is always about race or not, or are we playing the race card? Uh, we engage in those types of things while these complex interlocking systems are part of our daily life, of our nation, of our strategies, of our structures. And so yes, even in the California Community Colleges, that has a mission to make sure education is not preserved for the elite. Instead, it is accessible to anyone who has the ability to benefit even in the California community colleges, then that a system that enrolls the majority of students of color who are enrolled in higher education, this nation has an abysmally, in this, in this nation has an abysmally low completion rates. Uh, if we're generous, 13 to 26%. That's if we're generous. Most of them are down toward the 13%, and many community colleges are down toward 9% completion rates. You know, I went to a, to New York and we were visiting the SUNY system. Um, I mean, the, the, we were visiting the CUNY system and we were interested in ASAP, which is a accelerated associate degree program. And we were learning this is a phenomenal program that was getting results that was amazing. It was completely celebrated. No colleges had, had uh, replicated it. And we go and we visit all these different Colleges, we go to LaGuardia, we go to Gutman, we go, we go to all these different colleges. And we are just amazed at what we see. And one of the colleges, they said, you know, we have a 24% uh, success rate. And they were celebrating that. And I was like struggling, because I was like, well, that means 76% of them don't succeed, right? So I, I went back to my college, and, I, and I'm the president at this point. That means I've been at the college for at least, you know, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 years. At least 12 years, because I was a CIO for, for 10 or 12 years, 10 to 11 years. So I said, what's our success rate? And I learned that our success rate was 9%. All of a sudden, 24% sounded damn good. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, they are rocking and rolling. <laughs> I guess it's all in perspective. <laughs> okay, nonetheless, disaggregate the data, it can be predicted by race. And so we have to look at, you know, the fact that we're probably not the most sophisticated when it comes to talking about race. Uh, it often gets reduced to a false dichotomy of good, bad, as Robin DiAngelo says, it's good, bad dichotomy where I'm racist, I'm not racist. It's about an individual and it ignores the many different levels and layers of racism, the complex levels of environmental racism, structural racism, um, you know, different types of uh, ways in which we uh, look at, you know, cultural racism, the ways in which uh, racism exists. But it is a system of oppression and advantage that's based on race. Uh, and it involves the power to maintain that system. And Paul Gorski says that. He comes out of the Racial Literacy Institute at George Mason University, and he does a lot of racial literacy work. I'm a little bit of a Paul Gorski groupie, if I admit it. You know, I follow the man around. He's probably got a restraining order out. I don't know. <laughs> but, I, you know, I, I consume everything he says. And, and it's just probably also, it makes, it makes me confront my own assumptions and biases, you know. When I first signed up for what I was, I looked at him, you know, he's a neat uh, white man that, uh, you know, as my son would commonly say, looks like he was a hippie in his day or something. And, uh, and I thought, oh, no, okay, 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 okay. He's gonna teach me about racism, okay. 
right? You know, I, I struggled a little bit. And then I got into his scholarship and I got into his work. And boy, was I in for a pleasant and amazing uh, gift from him. So it made me check my own assumptions about what was possible. Now, I describe racism as a system and it means that one can be advantaged and participate in the oppression of others even if you don't believe in those concepts or perspectives. Uh, even if you, you don't um, have that perspective, for an example, about another racial group individually. You participate in that system. Uh, and until you confront the system or the structure, or being willing to confront that system or the structure, then you're a part of it you know, as a collective, you're a part of it as an individual, we're a part of it as colleges, we're a part of it as leadership teams, we're a part of it as faculty, as staff, et cetera. So that's something for you to think on, whether we don't focus on changing necessarily individual attitudes and behaviors, et cetera, that you focus on changing those systems and those structures. And so a lot of times when we're working with faculty and staff and say, well, what are we doing in order to decrease those disparities? A lot of times the work that they're doing are things that fix those students. They're poor, they need more financial aid. They um, need more tutoring. We need to have the library open longer. We need more counseling. Now those are important things and we do need all of that. Uh, but part of that work has to be, we need to look at our curriculum. We need to look at our sequencing. We need to look at our policies that we have in place that impact the student's ability to get in, get through, and get out all time, and get out on time. Okay, so it's not about what we're thinking or feeling uh, or sometimes doing, it's about the structures that are in place. So when someone asks me, okay, Regina, every time you open your mouth, it's always about race. Uh, well, one, because I live in these United States and I'm socialized in these United States, but even so, um, I'm not offended by that. I used to be, you know, I used to get on my little high horse and you had to give me time to get down, you know. <laughs> but I'm not offended anymore because I understand the question now. You see, we live and we work in a white dominant framework. We're raised and socialized in a space where because every aspect of society has been intentionally decided and designed to affirm and value your race and your culture, if you're part of the white dominant framework. To support and benefit your well-being. To advantage your access to housing and finance and employment. We have the results to show it to define you and your characteristics as the standard of beauty, success. This is what excellence looks like. To create a space where you're comfortable racially, virtually 24 seven. Where you're taught from the first day of your schooling of the superior contributions of your people to literature, to science, to technology, to philosophy, the fine arts, that your language is romantic and that your literature is superior. And it defines you and your people as a majority when nine-tenths of the people of the world are people of color. And it defines you and all that you represent as the definition of goodness, virtuosity, integrity, industry, and that black and brown races represent the opposite of that. And that by definition are bad and without principle and lack of integrity and lazy and dishonest. And if that's the message whether it's fair or not, whether it's right or not, whether you got that message as an individual or not. But if that's the collective socialized message that you get from cradle to grave, from your family, from your homogenous neighborhood, from your educational system, from the media, from your homogenous workspace, from the places you study, you live, you play, you love, you marry, and even you die, then how could you have a different framework? How could you know differently? So I understand the question. And of course, you may recognize I'm drawing on the work of the sociologist Robin D'Angelo, uh, who is a white female social scientist and renowned for her, her white studies work and the author of White Fragility, Why Is It So Hard for White People to Talk About Race? And it reminds white people, that she reminds white people that nothing in your dominant framework gives you the information you will need to have an informed opinion on one of the most complex, nuanced social dilemmas for the last several 
hundred years. It's no one's fault. It's how we're socialized, and it has been put in place for centuries. So the work that you have to do, all of that great work that I'm hearing and the different types of things that are happening, uh, the goals that you have, you know, it's a heavy lift, uh, but you have a commitment and a dedication to do that, which means it's possible, but be easy on yourselves because you are up against centuries of a solidified structure. So I'm gonna posit that unless you've had, and she posits, unless you've, had spent, unless you've spent several years of scholarship in service of racial literacy, none of us are as sophisticated or as fluent as we wanna be. We're gonna be clumsy and we're gonna get it wrong. We're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna, we gotta be willing to trust each other and not judge and we gotta, we gotta make sure that we don't fall into the trap of considering racism in those simplistic ways I mentioned. And I'm gonna tell you it's gonna be uncomfortable. Indeed, trying to maintain white comfort maintains racial status quo. And we may not like some of the things that we say, we may not like feel, uh, checking out or even, dis, you, know, you might feel like checking out, you might dismiss what you're hearing, et cetera. It may not match your values or your ideological perspective or your worldview, that's okay, that's okay. I just encourage you to set the tone, I just encourage you to stay with it, to engage to understand, sometimes we'll hear things like, I don't feel safe, you know? Well, I wanna make a distinction between safety and comfort because it is through the discomfort that we move forward to be able to get to what you need to get to in order to have the change in the student outcomes and, and, and experiences. Uh, say that again. Oh. I am. Yeah, thank you. Oh, did I hit it by mistake? I'm so sorry. <laughs> see, I told you. <laughs> okay, um, let's see, where was I? In order to, um, give me one second. Okay, I'm making a distinction between safety and discomfort. Um, so sometimes people will say, I don't feel safe. Let me just make that distinction. It's not safe if you leave your house and you go out and you get stopped for a traffic ticket and there's a high probability that you will not come out of that situation alive. Now that's not safe. If you leave the store with some Skittles and you walk in an unfamiliar neighborhood and you don't survive that, now that's not safe. If you're barbecuing, sleeping, going to work, going from work, driving to, driving back, walking, bird watching, and there's a likelihood that through legally sanctioned means, you won't survive it. Now that's not safe. If there's a possibility that somebody, you say something wrong, you said Latinx instead of Chicano Chicanics, or you said black instead of African American, and oh my God, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do, somebody's gonna think I'm racist. That's discomfort. That's all right, we can get through that. We have to give each other permission to be imperfect. We can have compassion for each other and, and support each other in our struggle, right? That's just simply discomfort, so stay with it. Uh, but make a distinction between safety and discomfort, okay? And we're not gonna eradicate it, we're talking about it for about 90 minutes or some, a, one, a single one-off training. It's a lifetime of work that have to help make us, have to help, help us develop, it might make us uncomfortable. And trust me, if you do the hard work of dressing those structures and mitigating those structures, you are gonna make mistakes, you're gonna get it wrong. You're gonna say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, your colleagues might get mad at you, you're gonna have what I call, you know, uh, experiences of privilege where we get to argue over about three or four semesters about whether the GPA should be a 2.6 or a 2.8 as if there's a distinction because we make this stuff up. You know, we get to do that. And in the meantime, uh, cohort after cohort after cohort of students come through and don't have the benefit of your wisdom in terms of how you would have changed that structure. We get to do all of that, and, but we're still gonna get it wrong. One time I was uh, having a conversation, I was on NPR and I was talking to Michael Krasny. Okay, and just in full disclosure, I was just starstruck. I couldn't believe I was talking to Michael Krasny. So, you know, I don't know what the show was about. 
I just watched him, right? I have no idea what the show was about. At some point, they asked me a question, and I was, I was on with the chancellor of the system, um, Eloy uh, uh, Oakley. And at some point, they asked me a question, and I, you know, stammered around until I could figure out that they were talking to me and that I was supposed to say something. And when I answered it, I talked about the ASAP program and how we were targeting certain students. And I thought, I left that show, I thought, oh, wasn't that great, wasn't I great? How'd, how'd I do, didn't I do really great? You know, I was really in awe of it because I had actually sat in the room with Michael Krasny. And then I got an email from a listener from Rhode Island and he said, uh, Dr. Stemex Stroud, can we ask you to demilitarize your language because we have students who really do have targets on their back. They really are being killed for real. So the first, my first reaction, as I said at my desk, was like, oh my God, you know, I had to get over myself and my ego because, you know, Regina Stem Extra Diversity Award you know, made that fundamental mistake. And then I reached out to him and I thanked him so much for bringing that to my attention. I had not even considered when I said we were targeting students. I thanked him for that. And then I employed one of the colleagues at the college, actually, one of the communications faculty, to help us look at our language and the ways in which we refer to students and the culture that we create. So for an example, uh, and you mess up sometimes, you get it wrong sometimes, but uh, we are no longer have faculty who are in the trenches. This is not a war zone. We no longer target students. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, as a matter of fact, somebody said I really messed it up for them because they couldn't say bullet points. <laughs> <laughs> somebody said, now Regina has really changed the way I talk forever and now I don't know how to say it. You know, we have points of emphasis, you know. <laughs> so those types of things are part of our lexicon, part of our language um, that we can that we can address. Uh, and, you know, sorry to say, but English itself is inherently has, you know, racist foundations. So that's why you see a lot of the connotations. Uh, I can't tell you how many faculty have said to me um, that uh, I, because I was a state academic senate, that I went to the dark side. So the first thing I let them know, I'm sure they might be thinking about Darth Vader or something, but I had to let them know that first of all, dark is beautiful. It's a wonderful side to be in. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that affirmation and validation. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then the other thing is I just, you know, I just pay attention to that because we do it subconsciously. Uh, and many of us may not know. For an example, I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in where they said, let's just get the low-hanging fruit first. Now, uh, not everybody, but, you know, I'm from the segregated South. And so when you say low-hanging fruit to me, it immediately strikes up the image of lynching because of Billie Holiday's song, Strange Fruit. So if you said, let's do the low-hanging fruit first, I don't know what you said after that. Because what I experienced is a microaggression. You had no intent whatsoever. Matter of fact, you may not even know the song, right? But it's a reality. And not everybody who looks like me has that experience. But it means that we have, you know, it, it's just part of the, you know, that's a part of my framework, my dominant framework, or my framework that's not dominant. It's not a part of the white dominant framework. You, you meant no harm, and, you know, saying let's just go after the easy stuff first. So it's part of our, it's, it's part of the work we do. Now, I said this was your moment. I see evidence of the innovation and the creativity and the commitment. So I'm gonna encourage us to reconceptualize the issues. Let's reconceptualize the problem. Instead of asking, when we look at those disparity in the indicators, and we look at the disparities in just about every indicator, there is a decrease or there is a disparity between black and brown students and white students. But when you look at that, and instead of asking, why are those students not passing? Why are they not being successful? You may ask, why are we so consistently unsuccessful in teaching black and brown students? Why are we so consistently unsuccessful in serving black and brown students? Why are we so consistently unsuccessful in transferring black and brown students? And if you ask that question, 
It is about you looking at the practices, processes, procedures, and policies that impact their ability to get in, get through, and get out on time. Because the ones that do succeed, sometimes succeed, despite our practices, processes, procedures, and policies, not because of them. So we get to reconceptualize that. Why are there so few black and brown people on our faculty? Now that's a whole other two hour keynote for me, okay? But I would just say that what is it about our practices and policies that systematically excludes people of color such that you are looking at the disparity between the communities that you serve and the people who provide that service. Because we know we know how to teach and serve. We know we know how to do those things because we do it so well with some students. We know that, right? We know, for an example, I get commonly the comments that, well, people don't want to live here. Well, not at SLO, of course. <laughs> Just saying, when Jill said, will I come, well, do I want to be virtual or do I want to come in? She said, I don't know if you want to come to, to San Luis Obispo. I was like, who does not want to go to San Luis Obispo? Of course, <laughs> I'll be right there. <laughs> so, so I always tell people when they have trouble finding uh, candidates, okay, start with the ones that come to you. They apply, the data shows that they get screened out in the paper screening, they apply. And they apply whether they're in San Luis Obispo and the, or they apply whether they're in Lake County, uh, which is really rural. <laughs> okay. So you are gonna take on a stance uh, that requires some type of a commitment, but you can't do it alone. It requires a leadership perspective because leadership matters. And in that leadership, we can see that you have a gift of an equity-minded leader here. Uh, and so I, I typically ask the CEOs about their perspective about equity leadership so that I can see what's guiding the lens through which they see things, the framework they're working on. And you know, what I was really appreciated in this statement is that it goes, first of all, it says we're not gonna necessarily stay comfortable. It says that we're gonna be, make sure that we're gonna look at our structures Notice that it didn't say initially that the students have deficits and we've got to fix and help those poor little black and brown people. But instead, we're gonna look at ourselves and figure out what we need to do that's creating these outcomes. Uh, so I really appreciated that uh, uh, enlightened uh, statement. So we have to take on a, uh, this stance that requires this commitment. It requires equity-minded leadership and it requires a commitment to become an anti-racist institution. Let me just do a time check here. So. Because we have to be careful that our disparity is not normalized. Uh, and that sometimes the, it can be seen as, uh, you know, something that we know, well, this is just how it is. I mean, they're not prepared or, uh, you know, we're working on those things or, you know, they're not comfortable or what, whatever it might be. So we have to take a look at that. We have to uh, pay attention to our data. We have to be willing to disaggregate it by, by race. And to make that a uh, point, I want to say this. If you came into this college on Monday and you looked at your student outcomes data and it showed that there was a significant gap between black and brown students succeeding and white students. And as a matter of fact, black and brown students were succeeding exponentially greater than white students. Uh, that they were transferring much more. Immediately, somebody would call IT. They would let them know that the data warehouse has been hacked. <laughs> that something's not right here. This is not right, this has got to be. Clearly there's a problem with the data. We've been compromised. This can't be right. Forensic IT consultants would be hired and experts would be engaged to figure out what in the world is going on here. And that is because white student failure is not normalized. It's incomprehensible. Uh, it's uh, in many ways unlike black and brown student failure. Black and brown student failure is so normalized that we can go the entire history of the institution 
and not see it as a state of emergency. It would be, we do business as usual. We have those kinds of outcomes and we come in every day, day in and day out, and stand by our practices, our policies. We defend them vigorously to maintain them because that's what we determine to be excellent. And that excellence, that definition of excellence maintains the status quo of black and brown student failure. Okay, but before y'all run me out of here because it sounds like I'm just saying everything's wrong. <laughs> I wanna say that I appreciate the vision, the mission, the values of Cuesta College. And you have a vision, mission, you have a, a, a values of access, success, and excellence. And that access, success, and excellence is because you have a commitment to all students having access, success, and excellence. So when you disaggregate your data by race, figure out whether you have access, success, and excellence with students as disaggregated by race, and that'll tell you where you want to work in order to be able to stay mission critical and to realize and live your values. Because in education, there is historical inequality there, uh, and our system is built and founded on that historical education, and it's not easy to address something that's so invisible uh, that, that uh, perpetuates these uh, disparities, despite how hard people work. I mean, there are just people who genuinely care. They're dedicated. They want to they want, they want to get it right, and they want their students to be successful. They care about the students and the families of the students. Uh, and sometimes people are just pulling their hair out and trying to figure out what do we do. We tried lots of different things. And so that's why I'm hoping that my comments to you, where I'm really driving home the issue of the structures, not about you, but about the structures, uh, that I'm hoping that those will be, will resonate in some ways and will be things that you use in order to really address what's called the centrality and normativity of whiteness in the academy. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm wishing you well with that. It surrounds us, it's hard to see, it's considered neutral. By default, it's invisible to the naked eye. You know, uh, uh, people will say to me, okay, Regina, well, just like give me an example. You know, like what do you mean? Well, there is a lot of work that we can do to decolonize our environments, our classrooms, our curriculum, our grading. And I actually heard some evidence of that happening uh, in when you were reading the um, reading the information about the awards. Uh, so I'm glad that you have that kind of a resource on the campus and that hoping that you, I'm glad that you value it and honor it enough to award it uh, and to recognize it in an award and hope that you will, uh, hope that you will um, draw on it and perpetuate it. Um, because you are up against a lot. So first I'm gonna tell you, we have systems that are created and uh, these principles are the principles that the nation was founded and the government was established and the constitution was created. And so I'm gonna show you what contributes to the worldview. And that little tiny picture down there is a picture of the nine Supreme Court justices. And first of all, let me just in the interest of full disclosure, say that this demonstration or this slide uh, is the work of Robin D'Angelo. This is not my original thought, though I thought it was pretty impactful. And so I'm gonna share with you that you're looking at um, the uh, senators, top US companies, news, who determines uh, what TV shows we watch, top military advisors, advisors who determines what movies get made, US governors. And you can see in this, uh, the little yellow boxes are where there are people of color. You can see the centrality of whiteness in most that happens in this nation that influences just about every aspect of our life. Now, Robin D'Angelo does a much um, better job with this, but I wanted to introduce it to you, and if you Google her work, I'm sure you'll come across it uh, in that. And that, what I'm trying to establish is the normalcy uh, you know, of this dominance. I'm trying to establish that it operates all around us and is understood as neutral and normal and excellent and good. 
all right? So we have to take care and ensure that our systems don't replicate and perpetuate those inequities that we think we're designed to eradicate. It means that we address inequity and racism head on and we become smarter and more sophisticated about it with our students, uh, with our community members, and, we don't, and they don't have to suffer because we fail to do so. And understanding the interconnectedness of those systems and structures. And so when you talk about equity in the academy, Dr. Paul Gorski, who I told you was my boyfriend, <laughs> he says of the Equity Institute that equity is a mindset, it's a heart set. It's not a to-do list, because a lot of people ask me, well, Regina, what do, what, you know, like, what do I do? Okay, checked my syllabus, check. Um, you know, we made sure that you know, we had a welcome day, check. We, have, we celebrated you know, whatever it might do, check. We got a commitment statement from the board, check. You know, what, what do I do? It's not a checklist, though there are lots of different things that would be manifested. It is an ideological perspective. And if you have an ideological perspective around that, and it might take help to cultivate that. I don't know, you don't have to have you know, the same ideological perspective that you know, I have. As a matter of fact, when I was a state senate president, I remember telling people, I'm working on the ability to recognize that people are entitled to think differently than I do. I'm really working on that. No matter how wrong they are, <laughs> <laughs> they're entitled to do so. All right. So, uh, if, you, if you lead with this perspective, you, you really are not doing a to-do list. You really are saying, what's the lens through which I'm willing to see things, and how am I willing to interrogate different things using that perspective? How do I use equity as a framework for interrogation, critique, and problem solving? That's the work that you will do, and we have to get smart about it, you know. Uh, as Dr. Bell Hooks wrote, social and political constructions of oppression and discrimination against women and people of color, in particular, people of African descent, remain embedded in our systems, in our American political, economic, religious, and educational institutions. Uh, I wish I had written that, but she did. So how we respond matters. We can't tinker around the edges. You have to be able to actually look at the institution and its structures. And do so at the pace of the people that you're trying to serve, not at the pace of the privilege, because this is what we, what we commonly do in education. We commonly will take, as I mentioned, semesters, uh, and we will take things slow so that we can keep people engaged or so that you know, we, people will listen. Uh, and so we tend to take things slower uh, at the pace to maintain the comfort of the very people that we're trying to engage in this conversation. And I'm just suggesting that that is not the driver, that's not the foundation, that indeed you work at the pace and the urgency of the people you're trying to serve. Uh, and be careful that we're not doing, you know, like individual things like mistaking celebrations and diversity events for actual anti-racism work and haggling over terms and arguing about data where a mere discussion is about, and, and, and implying that that mere discussion is infringing on our rights to remain entrenched uh, in the neutrality of what exists in the uh, academy. In the meantime, we continue to get the same results that we get. And we miss the opportunity to reframe those questions as I suggested. So there are things you can do. One is, we look at faculty and staff diversity and how it supports student success. If you're really interested in changing the disparity and the gaps in just about every student indicator that you have at Cuesta College, there is a disparity in the gaps, uh, at gaps um, for black and brown students. Then one of the ways that the research shows, that the data shows, the experiences show, is that diversity of faculty increases the ability uh, of students to be successful. And there are lots of different reasons why. There are some seminal studies that show that. Um, so how do we, that's how we change our success rates. Um, and it's hard to address because everything, um, be because we are looking at uh, our, our systems and structures right now as they are, and we're not interrogating them. I was, uh, when I became a president at Skyline College, I was hiring, we had the pleasure of being able to hire, it was like nine faculty. We were excited because we hadn't been able to hire. 
Uh, I had been a vice president of instruction, so you know that was always what, what we wanted to do. We were excited about it. And uh, I would get the finalist. And as I got about the sixth finalist, I realized that every candidate, every single candidate that I met would identify as white. Now, first of all, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, so I, I, I said, stop, 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 wait a minute, time out. What's happening here? Well, first of all, I froze to faculty hiring. You would have thought that I cooked the rabbit in the Glenn Close movie. I'm telling you, that, that really woke the institution up. People couldn't believe it, this new president, you know, all of those different things. Uh, and I asked this committees, what is it that's happening that we're systematically excluding black and brown people? I didn't say any individual on the committee is racist. I didn't believe that, as a matter of fact. I believe that they really were trying to get the best people that they could for the institution. But what is it? So we stopped. We deconstructed our processes. We worked with human resources. We changed the job descriptions. We looked at the criteria. And it was criteria like, you know, things like, you know, have to have, uh, I love the five year experience criteria thing that you all were talking about. Have to have five years of, you know, experience in something, right? What's the difference between a person who has five years and a person who has four years and eight months? Or four years and six months? Or a person who has three years? What if that excellence comes in the person who actually has two years? What if more excellence comes in that person than comes in the person who has 20 years? How do we miss out on that as a resource? So we have to check and see, are these arbitrary things that we're putting in because we are, we are accustomed to and we use those things as proxies. And that thing like time as a proxy, is really, it really has the impact of being a, uh, a perpetuating inequity because time as proxy is built on a foundation of not everybody always having access to these jobs. So time alone is a proxy for maintaining the disparity, though no one will assign it as something that is designed to exclude people. And we know that diversity of faculty impacts student success in terms of the real numbers. There was a seminal study that was done out of Foothill De Anza where they studied more than 3,000 students and they um, uh, identified the difference in the students in terms of them being with a, a diverse faculty and in terms of them being uh, not having access to a diverse faculty. And the student success rates were pretty uh, exponential, uh, phenomenal. So let's see what we got going on here. Now, this is data that comes out of 2018's uh, Campaign for College Opportunity. Uh, now, and, and your data is improved uh, by about five percentage points. Uh, you no longer have, for an example, full-time faculty at 78%. You have a full-time faculty at 73% white. Uh, so the data has improved. And that's actually pretty phenomenal for the college because across the state in 20 years, the, the improvement in faculty diversity particularly only changed by 1%. It only changed by 1% in 20 years. So actually, that's, that's pretty good to see those kinds of changes. But if you look, you have uh, about one third of your students are Latinx, Chicano, Hispanic, Mexican American. Um, but your faculty don't represent that. Uh, nor, do your, nor will you get it through your pipeline of your adjunct faculty, uh, the people who are making decisions about their lives that will impact their lives and their journeys. Uh, don't represent that. Uh, and even your senior leadership, though that has changed as well, you now have about 60% white senior leadership. Uh, so, so there have been some progress uh, in that. I particularly appreciated the honest and self-critique. And I have to say that I visited a lot of colleges, I work with people on, on uh, race and equity literacy, uh, and typically I'm having conversations with people about how to think about things, but you nailed it. You nailed it. I read the student equity plan. You absolutely nailed it. You said on almost every indicator of student success, 
We as a college are underperforming for Latinx and black students. Underperformance is consistent year after year. So you, you were unafraid and unapologetic and intentional in making that statement right out in your student equity plan. I didn't have to read far to get it. And what it told me right away is, oh, these people get it. Uh, they recognize that it wasn't that our students are underperforming, it's that we are underperforming. Uh, and so they recognize the dual responsibility that exists in this. So I really appreciated the honest critique. The responsibility of the college to improve our uh, performance requires us to examine our own entrenched practices. Again, nailed it. Intentionally work towards dismantling the status quo as opposed to blaming the students. Got it. You know, I, I, I thought my work is done here. Got it. <laughs> Give yourself a hand. Give yourself a hand, okay? And you said our faculty, our counselors, and staff, and managers, and administrators are competent and well-trained professionals, absolutely, in their disciplines and specializations, but are not adequately prepared to produce successful outcomes in racially and ethnically minoritized students. Even the fact that you use minoritized as opposed to minority told me about your consciousness and your literacy. So I really appreciated this and had full confidence in the things then that followed in the student equity plan, the strategies that you put forward. And I would encourage you to really kind of think through and strengthen those strategies around auditing your processes and decolonizing curriculum and environment and those types of things. So there's always plenty of work to do, but you, to me, really got it in terms of what you realize you have to do. Uh, you, you included comprehensive professional development, student supports as well. You included examining the practices in the classrooms, examining the assumptions that you have. So I really appreciated that. I want to introduce you to someone. This is Marcus. He was one of your students. Um, so uh, Marcus is 24 years old. And I met Marcus last night at, when I checked into the hotel. Uh, and Marcus, uh, you know, of course, we don't go anywhere where we're not talking to students about their future. You know, they think they're just going to bring their bags up, but, you know, we got to, there's an ed plan to be done. <laughs> so um, we asked him a little bit about it, and he said, education, it's not my statement, he said, but education is elevation. Uh, and he said, that's not my statement. I, I follow somebody on TikTok who tells me to go to school, and I was at Cuesta, he said, but I took a, some time off, and I'm, I want to go back and finish. I want to go back and finish up, and it gives me the opportunity to better myself. I, 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 but I wouldn't, I said, would you transfer? He said, I wouldn't transfer. I want my associate's degree, and that most, they mostly transfer people who want to be engineers. He said, but then I said, well, what would have kept you there? And he said, they need to do more things to foster more of a sense of community. It is a commuter school, so yeah, yeah, more community. Okay, now that's a truncated conversation we had. We kept him about 20 minutes and then we didn't want him to lose his job, okay? <laughs> but when he left, he left with instructions to come over to Cuesta College and talk to a counselor, get re-enrolled, and finish what he started. So be on the lookout for Marcus for me. And then we had to have room service because we had to eat because, you know, I had to finish writing this speech, <laughs> right? So Gavin came in. <laughs> now, Gavin is not one of your students, nor had he been one of your students, but I wanted to share with you because the more I talked to him, the more he represented probably some of the ideas out there uh, that young people have. And so I know that you're working on your enrollment, and you, I know that this institution identifies strongly with its transfer, its role as a feeder school to SLO. Uh, but as you saw with Marcus, uh, there's so much more that you get to really identify with. Gavin says, uh, I said, did you go to Cuesta College? He said, no, because I got good grades. So I went straight to Cal Poly. And then he proceeded to tell me, my, with my 65-year-old self. But you know, really, that's changing now, he said. I, I didn't have the heart to tell him that it was changed 30 years ago. But, um, he said, that's changing now, because some of my friends were like 4.0, and they still went to the community college. Uh, I said, well, what are you studying? He said, I'm studying kinesiology. I said, oh, because uh, when he was talking about his friends, he talked about engineers. And so I said, oh. Did you start in Kinegiology? He said, well, I started in business agriculture because my family uh, is in dairy farming, but I changed 
And you know, my whole first year was a COVID year, he said, and I didn't learn anything. I basically stayed in my dorm and took all my online classes, he said, and it was the same price. He said it was the same price, even though the, the only thing that was open was the cafeteria, even the library was closed, he said. And he said it was the same price at least five times when he talked to us. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I didn't have the heart. <laughs> so. And they charged me the same price even though everything was closed, and even, even the library, but they still charged me the same price. <laughs> So he was sharing his story. I brought that out to say, to just remind you, you're a comprehensive community college. That means you get to realize the full mission of the master plan. And the master plan was developed so that one, the top one-eighth would go to the UC, the top one-third would go to CSU, and all those who had the ability to benefit from an education would have access to higher education through the community colleges. And it was done so, the, the romanticized history is it was done so in order to support the economic integrity of the state because the people who were doing the master plan, Dr. Clark Kerr and his colleagues, his contemporaries at the time, realized that we needed to have that in order to support the economic integrity of the state. But the unromanticized version is, but they were concerned because they saw what they, what they saw as the tidal wave of black and brown students that would be coming because the demographics were changing. And they were concerned that that tidal wave would contaminate the excellence of the UC system. And so therefore they said, we've got to give people some alternatives to higher ed. And they set up this type of a master plan. Uh, and in do, but, but the romanticized history has been more about that it was so everybody would have access. And so there's a little bit of truth to all of that. Um, and it was important, and it made a difference in terms of the economic integrity of this state. So as I start to wrap up here, I'm going to remind you that this is your moment. We developed the scale of engagement because colleges, I know you can't read this, but we, we wanted colleges to be able to think about what are some of the measures that they have and also get ideas of things that they can do as they progress along the scale of engagement and equity. Some are still at the silent stage where they don't talk about it. We look, you know, I call it the all lives matter stage, all right? Uh, some are in symbolic where they have the commitment statements and they have the, uh, the uh, kind of fun fair, food, fashion, you know, type of events. Uh, it gets reflected in the mission, vision, and values. You might open with some acknowledgments. You have attention to things like your mascot and that kind of stuff. You try to pay attention to those kinds of things. Some are at the uh, awareness stage where they have projects and professional development activities and affinity groups and, you know, the, but still the centrality of whiteness and, and normativity of whiteness remains embedded as a framework. Some are actual changing processes. The hiring process is under review, the curriculum process is under review, they're doing guided pathways, they're auditing and changing their policies, they're changing the power holders, they're changing the decision making based on disaggregated data. And then some are at a comprehensive DEF framework where it's not just a one-off, but it is how all of these things fit together, whether it's hiring, outreach, communication, curriculum, et cetera. There are accountability measures in place where we hold each other accountable. We hold ourselves. So this is our moment. It's the opportunity to be the institution that you desire as defined by your own success goals uh, and it, in a way that reflects that you've addressed and mitigated the uh, structures uh, in ways that allow you to use your positions of influence and consequence, whether you are a faculty member, an administrator, a staff member, whether you're a custodian, a staff assistant, a counseling faculty member, whether you teach physics or whether you teach English or whether you teach uh, in, in a career technical education area, it is an opportunity to use your position of influence and consequence in order to make a difference and to move your agenda in this world. Because those strategies and theories and actions and practices that challenge and counter racism, that's what anti-racism is. Um, and so you either allow for those racial equity inequities to persevere or you confront them. There is no in-between space, Ibrahim Kendi says. There's no such thing as being not racist as not being anti-racist, okay? There's no in-between space. And then I'll just let you take a look at a picture of my boyfriend right here. <laughs> uh, 
He offers these 10 commitments that if you're engaged in equity, these 10 commitments. And you know, I subscribe to these commitments. And of particular importance is the one that he says, do not prioritize peace over equity. In other words, he says, I will prioritize equity over peace. Uh, so we'll get, we'll get practice at it. We'll, we'll, do, we'll go through different processes. We'll learn how not to be tone police so that you're not distracted by how I'm saying it because Regina, you must be an angry black woman, but you focus on what I'm saying, which is the oppression and the struggle that I'm trying to speak about. So we'll get that, we'll get that. You have students that have all kinds of experiences uh, and you will learn greatly from them. You will do good work as a result of your interactions with your students and as a, work, a result of learning from their lived experiences. Cuesta will continue to be recognized uh, for the good work that it does. Uh, I have confidence that you will make progress in every aspect of the work that you're doing. And I only hope that you, that I've, that I've said comments enough that have been supportive enough, thought provoking enough, um, that you would invite us here again. It would be my honor and my pleasure. Thank you. So thank you so much, Dr. Stanbeck Stroud. I appreciate your work. I appreciate the way you push me and all of your CEO colleagues to be serious about racial equity, your persistence, your leadership, and your message today. And you struck just the right note. Thank you. So the faculty hour will follow right after we conclude here. And a reminder that lunch will be served at 1215 at the 5000 complex near the cafeteria entrance. And our special surprise this morning, we're going to close our opening day convocation with a brief video featuring alumna Katie Cole, who wrote a love letter to Cuesta College. A love letter to Cuesta College. As my last semester comes to a close and I reflect on these past two years I've been at Cuesta, I am reminded that community college was never in my plan. But as senior year rolled around and I found myself lost in an overwhelming spiral of anxiety, the idea of what I thought I wanted didn't seem to work out. Low test scores and a very picky college list left me with little to no options. I opted to not even apply and choose the option right down the street. It made sense, right? I mean, my largest factor was fear of leaving my family and the only town I'd ever known. So why not take another year or two to solidify my plans and get my bearings a little more? I felt solid in my plan to attend Cuesta and figure it out. Little did I know what would happen next, 2020, the year the world shut down. I remember fear and panic ruling over my life and above all, pure uncertainty. But amidst that, my plan stayed true. It was a blessing in disguise. Unlike most kids in my graduating class, I did not intend on leaving home, so my plans were not uprooted. Same as everyone else that year, I began my college journey from the comfort of my childhood bedroom. I took Zoom classes in the same place my childhood art lined the walls. Among other classes, I took ECE 201 with Pamela Gordon Johnson and my eyes were opened. Within that first semester, gone were any thoughts of unworthiness or doubt. I was humbled and solidified in the choice I had made months prior, discovering through time that I ended up exactly where I was meant to be. I made connections with professors through Zoom office hours and friends in breakout rooms. The best was made of an overall bad situation. We reunited through the uncertainty. That first year passed quickly, and soon enough, it was summer. I remember talking to old high school classmates and proudly saying I was at Cuesta. I no longer felt stigmatized by the community college choice. I felt proud. Amongst the world of chaos, I felt grounded in my education. As my second year at Cuesta came along, I was allowed an in-person class. This was crucial to my time here. The class was daunting, to say the least. Statistics with Michael Kinter, who does not mess around. But through those four hours a week in one incredibly overwhelming blue book, I found friends and community. I could not have done that class without the Student Success Center. The stats log quite literally became my second home, and I was recognized by name for many of the tutors for my time spent. That stats class opened my eyes to Cuesta resources. There are so many. Being on campus helped me to appreciate even more the support we as students are offered. I took a job at the preschool for that semester and was mentored by many of the staff there. 
my classroom learning was amplified with real application, a chance I so greatly valued. Being an employee of Cuesta while also a student allowed for great learning and how to balance many things, but I felt so supported by professors and staff alike. Soon enough, that semester drew to a close as well. College applications picked up and so did the stress. Having not applied to any other colleges during high school, I was overwhelmed with the process. I had no idea where to even start, but yet again, I was guided by Cuesta. Tutors read over essays and counselors double-checked. I was so thankful to be able to present the honorable grades and student involvement I had during these past two years. I even wrote my college entrance essay on how community college was not a part of my plan, but how it ended up being the best path for me. I sit here now writing you this letter from the Student Success Center. I decided to tutor for child development in my last semester to hopefully help some students just as I had been helped last semester. It has been incredibly engaging and helpful to meet other students. Now, as the semester draws to a close, I am feeling so many emotions. I am reflecting on these past two years and I am flooded with joy. If only I could go back and tell myself from two years ago that this would be the best choice I've ever made. The opportunity of two years free with the Cuesta Promise is too good to pass up. The launching pad that Cuesta would offer would be way greater than I had ever imagined. I reminisce on that girl who was afraid to leave the only town she'd ever known. I almost laugh thinking now that my plan is to move 1,500 miles away to go to school in Texas. But that's the whole point of all of this. I've grown immensely. Through two years of a pandemic and unfortunate situations, but two years that had growth nonetheless. Cuesta offered me so many opportunities, many of which I would have never imagined, but for that I am so thankful. My eyes were open through classes and I am now envisioning a future more direct, one with a career focused in helping the family system, something I didn't even know existed, but a passion I discovered. I am so sad to leave Cuesta College and I'm afraid of the unknown future, but I feel strong in the lessons I have learned here. I will forever mark this college as the place I learned to trust the timing of my life and to trust myself. So thank you Cuesta for being the launching pad of my life. All right, thank you all. Let's have an amazing fall.